If we want to reach wisdom, we have to learn to be very humble. And after we, we, we reach wisdom, we have to be more humble than before. Thank you for downloading this podcast. My name is Richard Rucroft. You're listening to Gnostic Lectures. This is lecture number 17, and the title of this lecture is Emotional Intelligence and How to Awaken It. My our co-host today is Mr. E. Jim G. Ross. How are you, Jim? Oh, fine. Thank you, Rick. Thank you again for inviting me. Emotional Intelligence, that... That reminds me of what Walter Russell said many years ago, that IQ tests are not really a good indication of what he called genius. And of course, what, um, what he calls genius is someone who is um, getting information from the cosmos, someone who is like um, Beethoven, someone like... Uh, Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein, those sorts of people. Newton. No. For years, uh, scientists have been measuring the intelligence level of people by giving them these tests. And the tests basically are uh, comparisons and uh, uh, in different areas of uh, what they can measure. But the problem with measuring intelligence at the level that they're doing, it's not, it doesn't really mean very much. And Walter Russell said that basically these IQ tests don't mean anything. The real uh, geniuses, the real geniuses that have um, contributed to mankind in the past, did very poorly in school. Yeah, well, uh, I do agree, you know, with you, and I do agree with Walter Russell. Uh, Gnostic anthropology and Gnostic psychology is moving in a total different direction, you know, regarding what's really intelligence and the connection with consciousness or awareness. And this is something that we have said it before. If there is no consciousness, if there is no awareness about reality, how can we speak about intelligence? You see, if, uh, for example, if I am a soldier and I'm trained to kill, okay, if I am in a battlefield and, and I'm fighting an, an, an enemy army and I kill a lot of enemies, you know, I will be given a, a medal, you know. I will be received as a hero when I come back to my country. But what if I come back home and I get crazy and I start shooting at civilians, you know, killing children and in defense women and old people? I'm a criminal. So in, in reality, what we call intelligence is the skill to learn and to apply it, to apply certain, you know, capabilities. But without consciousness, how can we speak about any kind of intelligence? You well, know? well, driving a car is a skill. And I remember one time I was driving a car and there was a policeman behind me and it was late at night and it was a red light. Now my light turned to green and there was an oncoming car in the opposite direction at 90 degrees and I didn't proceed. And the cop behind me was wondering why I was just stay, staying there at the green light, but I did not go into the intersection. And that man in the other car went right through the intersection. He would have killed me. So I'm not saying that I'm, I'm very intelligent or anything, but it's, it's a form of, of knowledge, isn't it? That's correct. You know, basically, from a Gnostic point of view, you know, real intelligence is connected with consciousness, awareness. And in a religious language, uh, we can say soul, having a soul. But in reality, Gnostic anthropology and Gnostic psychology is teaching us that we are sleeping 24 hours a day. So it means that our consciousness level is very low. So then, of course, our intelligence level is also low. So it, then, you know, in reality, we have to learn to awaken our consciousness. But we have superior senses, and this is extremely important. And this is connected with the seven endocrine glands, endocrinology. 
for a mysterious reason, you know, scientists don't want to talk about that publicly very much. They have done it occasionally, and I remember many years ago, they were talking about that openly in the 80s. So for some reason, they didn't talk any longer. But Gnostic anthropology is bringing back all that information because if we can awaken our superior senses, we are really awakening our intelligence. Our skills will be developed. And of course, having a soul, I mean a stronger level of consciousness about reality, we are going to be using those skills, you know, in a superior manner. Instead of creating wars, instead of glorifying war, we, shouldn't we glorify peace? You know, what's more intelligent? You know, unless we are under attack, and of course we have to defend ourselves. But the problem is today there is a business of war. There is an incredible machinery of war where some companies dedicate themselves to make weapons. So this is their product. If there is, if there is no war, they have to create a war to sell their products. Am I right or wrong, you know? Doesn't, doesn't it sound a little bit evil or more than a little bit? Well, yes, there is evil intellect as well as uh, what we would characterize as good intellect. Um, I'm sure the world is full of, of um, overlords that want to, you know, use their abilities, their higher intelligence, I suppose you would call it. Their, uh, I don't want to say the word illumination, but you can have... Isn't it possible to have two different kinds of intellect here, one with ego and one without? I, yeah, according to Gnostic anthropology, yes, you know. There are very evil individuals who are extremely intelligent to evade justice, for example, or criminal, you know, a, 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 serious, a serial killer who is evading justice and killing people and sometimes pro, uh, provoking the police, you know, uh, given some kind of uh, signals about what they are going to do next and sometimes it's an ambush you see so it's basically it's learning to use their intelligence in an evil manner you know and we are all imprisoned within those possibilities because we have the ego within the animal psychology the egotistic psychology the me 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 you know first second third and, and also we have the soul, which is us. We are all important, you know. So one is connected with love, you know, and the other is connected with hatred. You know, when I hate myself and I hate other people and I take advantage of other people, of course. You know, there was just on television, we've had, as, as we're recording this, the riots in London. This is one year before the Olympics. This is August of uh, 2011. And uh, basically there was a shooting and gangs have uh, decided late at night that they were going to start uh, burning buildings, smashing windows, grabbing flat screen television sets and electronics, and generally creating tremendous havoc in the streets. And when one of these uh, gang members was being interviewed by the BBC, I was astonished at the, f at the fact that his attitude was that, well, I just go out at night and join these groups because I want to break into stores and I want to steal things. It's getting stuff for free. And I thought, wow, I mean, um, yeah, that, that sort of gang mentality is a form of intelligence. Um, I, I saw one video where um, a protester was down on the ground, he was injured, and the others, several others, were going through his uh, pack sack and taking things out. He was being robbed right on camera. And it's just absolutely unbelievable. The, the, we're talking about, in is this intelligence? Yeah, this is the point, you know. Uh, this is the situation that when we are trying to impress the world, developing concepts like IQ or EQ, which is emotional intelligence, in reality, we are playing games with the unknown. I mean, if I were there and had emotional intelligence, I would say, ooh, this is too big of a crowd, I'm going in the other direction. I mean, that's wise, isn't it? And, and how many people don't think like that in these, in these riots, you know? You know, that's correct, that's correct. So basically, you know, we had a lecture a few weeks ago called the three brains, remember? 
the three brains, this is scientists spoke about that also in the past. And if we study ancient medicine coming from Greece, the, the founders of Western medicine, if I don't, uh, if I am not wrong, one of them was Paracelsus, a man from Switzerland, and two Greek individuals that were geniuses of medicine. I believe they were Galeno, Galen, and the other one was Hippocrates. Well, these three individuals brought an incredible knowledge into the West, into the Western society regarding medicine. But what our schools of medicine don't teach is that these individuals brought the entire amount of knowledge from the past. And, and most of people continue believing today that Mr. Darwin is right, that we are evolving and then the past is always wrong and the, and the present is better than the past. But they ignore completely that ancient civilization were more advanced than ours. So we are not evolving, we are descending, we are involving. So Galeno, Galeno uh, from Greece and Hippocrates and Paracelsus, they were very advanced individuals, you know, regarding medicine, and they combined ancient Chinese, ancient Tibetan medicine, and they were the survivors, you know, Tibet, ancient Tibet is connected with the survivors from Atlantis, people who reached an angelical stage because they annihilated their ego. So were, they were more intelligent than we are today, superior being with 12 senses instead of five senses. And we can also call the three individuals, we can call them angels. They are superior beings that live in the parallel universes already, and we continue remembering them. So in reality, you know, these people were teaching that we have three brains according to the law of three, the law of creation, and we have seven endocrine glands, which is number seven is the law of organization of the universe. If we are talking about intelligence, intellectual intelligence or emotional intelligence, there is another kind of intelligence which is instinctive or motor, you know, connected with sexuality also. Because these three brains, we explained that before, the first brain, the intellectual brain, is in our, you know, is part of the cranial, the cranial vault in our brain. The second brain is this, the central medulla connected with the dorsal spine with all its nervous branches. It is a brain, even if we don't accept it. And this, the second brain is actually, you know, the second brain is connected with the motor activities of the body, connected with the instinctive activities, and even the sexual activities, because the instinct of procreation is connected with sexuality. And the third brain is not located in any specific place, but it is related to a specific, it is not related, I'm sorry, to a specific organ. But the third brain is connected with the sympathetic nervous plexus. And this is the emotional brain, connected with all the specific nervous centers of the physical organism. So these three brains, scientists spoke about that. I remember I read some articles in the past, in the 80s, they mentioned that. There were discoveries, but those discoveries, for, for a mysterious reason, have been ignored lately. And of course, the three kinds of intelligences, called intelligences, intellectual, um, motor, connected with the instinct, and emotional, of course, they are connected with, with the three brains. But in another lecture, we spoke about the seven bodies. We have seven bodies, you know. It sounds fantastic, ridiculous, incredible, too much to be absorbed. It is true. But in reality, we have a the mind is not the brain. The mind is a, is a body made of atomic particles. So thoughts are atomic. Emotions are molecular. So we have a, we have a molecular body or an emotional body. And we also have an instinctive physical body. It's our own physical body. So this is why, you know, in a moment of danger, we either fight or fly, <laughs> you see. Psychologists and psychiatrists speak a lot about that. In a moment of we, are, we are in danger, you know, we have to run to escape from, from a dangerous situation. 
Either we fight if we can handle it, or we run away, or we fly. So the emotional antennas are connected with, you know, artistic. You know, if we can even develop them, because there are, sub, there are positive emotions that are, and there are negative emotions. You know, and same thing with the intellect. We can develop positive thinking or negative thoughts. What makes a person to fall into depression? Why do we, why most of people today are depressed? Because they have developed negative thoughts and also they have developed negative emotions and they don't do physical activity. So their body, they cannot even move their body. And at the end, they become very ill. So the three brains are really controlling our skills, the, what we call intelligence. But scientists don't speak about that. They, they enjoy talking about IQ, EQ, and this is it. If you're a massage therapist and you're massaging someone, I know from my own studies of this years ago, although I've never done that sort of thing, they say when you have someone on the table and you're massaging a certain part of their body, it doesn't matter, a leg or an arm or something, as soon as you move the tissue in a certain area, the person on the table can have a memory. Uh, will start to remember certain things. And the massage therapist uh, people say that you have cellular memory. And if that's the case, really, we, you say you have uh, three brains, and really every cell in your human body has a type of memory, right? So you don't only have three brains, you have thousands of small brains, don't you? That's correct. It's basically, you know, we have to... The, the main trouble today for our scientists, they continue being three-dimensional. They forget that there are more dimensions than three. You know, NASA, NASA who is doing a space exploration, they have discovered already the parallel dimensions, you know. They even use a concept called, they, they talk about the hyperspace. What is that? They know if we transcend the speed of light, we can do incredible things. They know that already. Albert Einstein, when he discovered the relativity of time, time and space, he discovered the fourth dimension. And there is a fifth dimension, a sixth dimension. So essentially, using all those conceptions about reality, we do have a molecular organism, we do have an atomic organism, we have an electronic organism, and we have a cellular organism. And of course, they all have memories. You know, they all have memory. This is why we have the emotional, I mean, molecules and emotions are connected. Thoughts and atomic particles are connected. Scientists don't want to talk about that. Maybe they have discovered that already, but they are using it for military purposes. They are using it for intelligence, military intelligence or espionage, etc. etc. Or the corporate world want to use it, you know, to sell a product, you know, or to make more money. But in reality, humanity should have access to all this information. You know, this is well, there's a lot of hidden information from the world. I mean, uh, there used to be databases, uh, Dialog and so forth was a company that provided um, very, very um, inside information to corporations. And now you have to pay tens of thousands of dollars every year just to get access to these databases. I mean, there's so much knowledge out there that is not available on the internet. It's just unbelievable. But can I say something about um, uh, George Osawa and Michio Kushi, the two uh, founders of macrobiotics, okay? Years ago, I studied them. And they said a couple of things. For, for one thing, they, they said when you start eating clean food, like brown rice and very nice clean food that's really good for you, your thinking will change. And they also said that you should vary your diet. You should eat different things from time to time because they gave examples of, of a person who uh, ate the same diet every day. And that person would be in a, um, a mental rut where they would have, they would not be able to expand their thinking. So food is also related to thought, isn't it? That's correct. Yes, yes. This is why, you know, we said in a past lecture that our humanity at the moment is in a big trouble because science is not used properly. You know, corporations or governments or the military, you know, 
are people are scientists are working for them, and they have a contract. It, it's, the signed contract says that they cannot release that information to the public. So that knowledge belongs to the corporation or to the military or to the government. So whatever has been discovered, you know, cannot be shared properly, you know, with humanity. You know, I've worked with police forces and uh, I've, I've seen detectives enter information into a computer. And as soon as they press the enter key, they themselves could not get that information out of the computer. The computer is just this big vacuum cleaner that sucks in all the information. And you had to have certain... Uh, passwords and abilities to get any information out. It's just unbelievable, you know. <laughs> That's incredible, you know. Mm. So essentially, this is why, you know, it's extremely important to understand, you know, where those concepts of IQ or EQ are coming from. And we should add also the other kind of intelligence, which is the instinctive motor or even sexual. You know, this is why that we have different kinds of intelligence but as we said before, without consciousness, without soul, without awareness, if we don't understand the laws of nature, if we don't understand the purpose of life, of course, you know, we are going to be convinced that we are very intelligent and at the end we are not. You know, this is why the world is in trouble at the moment. We are in a big trouble. You know, the economy is collapsing everywhere. The whole world is in trouble. What happened? Why those multitudes in England or in France? France is in, in a big trouble already. Yeah, many of it, the countries are. Yes, yeah. Italy, you know, uh, Greece a few days ago, a few weeks ago. You know, when, when people are being taken away their pension, all people in Greece were taking part of their pension and they, you know, they had already a small pension to survive. When they were taking another portion, how can you survive? You see, and what about people who are unemployed and they don't see any possibility of finding a job? What do, what do you do? You go to your friend, your neighbor, your family members to support you, but there is a limit for that. So out of desperation, people unite forces with criminal people. That's right. And, and at the end, you know, people who are decent individuals are working together with criminals, assaulting, you know, uh, other people, or uh, going into building where where they can steal, you know, whatever they can. And and what what goes on in their head? Because if you if you realize what's going on in in their head, the thought process, it's um, they don't consider any downward potential to becoming a thief and a thug and uh, an arson and a, um, a basically a criminal in the streets. To them, they don't see that they're ever going to be punished uh, because the jails are full and the police are few and they know that uh, they're not going to be incarcerated and that they can get away with it and what goes what goes through their head when when they have no hope whatsoever of becoming uh having a normal life and there's they decide to do this sort of thing because they can and they don't care you know yes it's, right. a, it's an amazing mentality you know you know i i, I have had the chance to talk to people you know, who live in a stage of desperation from other countries, speaking with them on the phone. And they have said, you know, either I die, you know, begging for help, you know, on the streets, or I die fighting. You see, that means they will become violent individuals, people who used to be very peaceful people, and now they are in a big trouble. This is why there are so many wars and civil wars all over the world. So what's really missing here, with all respect, we are going to tell this, what is missing is a fundamental education. Our education is so limited, is so twisted. If we, if all of us, since kindergarten, were taught that we have three brains, and the three brains, you know, can balance our lives, we explain that there are people in Tibet, in, in the mountains, you know, monks that live in Tibet, men and women, they are all concentrated in the middle of the mountains and they, they are aware of the three brains. And what they do, they practice, you know, they, they, they haven't exhausted their intellectual brain. This is what's happening with our Western society. Doctors, PhDs, people who are extremely capable, you know, of improving the world, they have concentrated 
in exhausting their intellectual brain. And at the end, what happens? They end in a mental institution, you know, and they develop when they are getting older, all kind of tragedies, you know, insane asylums, you know, are actually cemeteries for those people who are intellectually dead. And they don't realize that they have, they have other two brains to be developed and to be, to be used properly. There are people who practice sports so much, and this is the motor brain, motor instinctive, you know, people who practice too much sports or they do physical activity too much, they are 40 years of age and they cannot function anymore, you know. These people become hemiplegic, paraplegic, you know, people with progressive paralysis, etc. At the end, they die young, you know, or they cannot function anymore because that brain was exhausted also. What about emotional, you know, the emotional brain? People who abuse the emotional brain are the ones who practice, you know, this uh, all kind of crazy music, morbid, you know, people who, you know, they, they say they are artistic in, within the artistic field, and in reality they are exhausted with drugs. They, they say, oh, they want to experience, you know, emotions, you know, superior emotions through drugs, you know, and they kill, they destroy their system. When you take heavy drugs, you destroy your genes. If you want to procreate a baby, your baby will come into the li into life sick with all kinds of real tragedies. And we, we, we are going to be responsible of doing that. So what we need to do is the opposite, to balance the three brains so that way we can really develop a superior intelligence, IQ, EQ, or instinctive intelligence. Even, you know, the sexual life Nobody's talking about sexuality. No, on the contrary, people are talking too much about sexuality. The wrong way. The but wrong the, wrong, way. the wrong sexuality. Mm. The wrong sexuality. This is why Gnostic anthropology is also teaching that. And in the future, we are going to be talking about that. Jim, how would you measure intelligence? IQ is an intelligent quotient. And I've, I've worked with many people over the years, uh, some of them mentally ill. Uh, and I can tell you that a person that is uh, has very diminished mental ability compared to a person who has tremendous mental ability, a genius or a normal person, let's say, there's a sliding scale. And how do you measure where a person is? I know that when you're, when you're uh, on the verge of being declared mentally ill, they give you what they call a mini mental test. They ask you, What's your name? What What's the date? Who's the president or prime minister? This sort of thing. And if you can answer those things, you are considered uh, capable, mentally capable. Okay. It's called a mini mental test. Well, if you're at that level where you can just barely tell what country you're in or who's the prime minister or who's the president, that's pretty diminished mental ability, isn't it? But how do you measure it? It seems like uh, as you progress toward the genius along the sliding scale, if you're if you're in in the human body looking out, you can't tell. Let's just say if you're um, if you have the met normal mental acuity at age 40, by the time you're 50, 60, 70, and your mental acuity is starting to diminish, if it is, it doesn't have to. You don't realize that your mental acuity is diminishing. You, there's no way of measuring it, right? Yeah, basically, you know, this is why, you know, Gnostic anthropology and Gnostic psychology and Gnostic biology is teaching us, you know, that when when the three brains become exhausted, we become part of a cemetery. We are already dead in one of those three or maybe the three brains. And of course, our capability will be diminished, you know, in an incredible way and in a very painful way. So mm -hmm. essentially, you know, how can we regenerate? Because we all fall into those mistakes, you know, based on the lack of knowledge. We said that our education is, is, is concentrated 100% into the intellectual aspect. With, with a few exceptions, there are the schools that teach you about music, painting, drawing, you know, or university, different. But in reality, every, every individual should be able to practice the three and to use these three kinds of intelligence. Albert Einstein is a good example, you know. Albert Einstein is a genius. Albert Einstein 
he knew about this. He used the intellectual capability, intellectual intelligence, the IQ, in an incredible manner. But at the same time, he developed his emotional intelligence by playing violin. He was playing Beethoven and Mozart in his own violin. And he spent hours and hours every week doing that. At the same time, you know, he did some physical activities. So he kept the three kinds of intelligence very much alive. He kept the balance, you know. You see, I don't, I don't know very much about Albert Einstein's life. Uh, you, you apparently do. But he discovered all of his major contributions to the world around mid-age. As he grew older and older, he didn't have any more big discoveries after that. No, what happened, he became very frustrated because his knowledge was used the wrong way. So he brought something very intelligently developed based on consciousness to help humanity to advance into the future. But they say the nuclear weapons were developed thanks to his, you know, knowledge. He brought into the world, you know, the, the atomic knowledge and the nuclear, uh, he was always against dividing the atom. Yeah, they, 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 they say splitting the atom, yeah. Yeah, yeah. splitting the atom. Yeah. And, and at the end, of course, you know, people did it anyway, and they, they were using it for, for the war, you know. The World War II ended when they threw two nuclear bombs in, in Japan. And of course, you know, after that, during the, the, the Cold War, all superpowers started to develop nuclear weapons. And of course, Albert Einstein became very disenchanted with the scientific community. He continued teaching, you know, private classes, or he became a very common individual after that. He was even teaching for free. He didn't want to make any more money, even he was offered, you know, high positions by powerful governments, you know, the US, you know, the, the British, the French, and the Russians, everybody wanted him to work for them and he refused to do it. He lived a very quiet life, you know, at the end of his life. If we really want to develop, learn to develop intellectual intelligence or IQ or emotional intelligence or EQ and any other kind of intelligence, we have to annihilate the ego, the subconscious, the animal psychology and to transform it into consciousness, to be able to perceive reality in a more clever manner. And of course, annihilating the ego is the key. And Jesus Christ, you know, who is very much known all over the world, he described the ego as the seven deadly sins. And he was teaching, how can we eliminate the seven deadly sins? The seven deadly sins, we can say they are intellect and they are also emotions. For example, you know, he described, uh, let's remember the seven deadly sins, they, they were lust, lust, they were anger, arrogance, greed, envy, laziness, and gluttony. Those are the seven deadly sins. Why seven deadly sins? Because they are ego, they are subconscious, unconscious, infraconscious. It means Last, what is last? Moses, you know, there is no contradiction between Jesus Christ and Moses. Moses was teaching about the Ten Commandments. And he, one of the, the Ten Commandments, number six, is fornication. Number nine is adultery. Okay, he criticized both. And even if, if we study Leviticus in the Bible, there he described both. What's fornication and what's adultery? So basically, lust then represents both. You know, and scientists ignore completely what happens with our sexual life, you know, and they are reinforcing the ego of lust. You know, saying that, you know, we are just animals, they agree with, with what we say, we are intellectual animals. And of course, we can have more than a sexual partner, you know, let's enjoy life, you know, and they even tell children and teenagers, you know, to, to have a, a very uh, sexual, active life since they are very young, they believe it's okay, it's good for the nervous system, you know, masturbation is okay, 
But in reality, they don't realize the consequences of their ignorance. They not only don't know, they don't know that they don't know. They ignore that they ignore, according to Socrates. We said it before. We said it before. I mean, when, when people have more than a sexual partner, you get from the other partner the karma, the positive and negative, good luck or bad luck. If you have more than a sexual partner, you get a lot of bad luck from the other sexual partners. So if we sleep with a prostitute, and the prostitute is having sex with many criminals, maybe one of those criminals is going to die shot on the streets. Well, suddenly we have sex with a prostitute, and that prostitute carries the negativity of that criminal, and she will transfer that negativity to her clients, and suddenly we get the bad luck of that criminal. We are walking on the streets, and a crazy bullet coming from nowhere will hit us. Well, this is the consequence, you know, of this kind of sexual activity, a wrong sexual activity. Fornication, we prefer not to describe it now, but it is in Leviticus. Read, study Leviticus, and you will understand it. So essentially, the opposite of lust is making love with love. You see, that's a positive emotion, and also it's a positive thought. When, when we have sex without love, without respect, without adoring each other, it's not pleasurable enough. Maybe it's pleasurable for some people, but it's not really pleasurable when there is love, when there are feelings, creative feelings for each other. Of course, it's a beautiful experience. So making love with love instead of lust. Well, there was a story uh, years ago in one of the, I forget which state it was, where a district attorney who, as you know, a district attorney prosecutes criminals, a uh, district attorney got tied up with a prostitute. And you're talking about uh, having sex with someone and uh, acquiring negative, I guess, egos. Ego is transferring from one person to another through the sex. And he, uh, in the end, uh, was destroyed. His whole career was just destroyed because he had sex with this prostitute and he began stealing drugs from the police lockup. And he stole, I'm not sure if it was cocaine or, or what the drugs were anymore, but he did this repeatedly time after time and finally he got caught. And he was a district attorney, attorney and he ended up in his own courtroom being prosecuted and went to jail. And here's this, here's an example where someone was brought down. It wasn't in the story. They didn't uh, connect the fact that he was, uh, had sex with prostitutes that they didn't think that that meant anything very much. But from a Gnostic point of view, we see very clearly that when you have sex with some a woman that who has sex with everybody, obviously one of those egos was a very strong desire to use drugs. And he uh, got developed a drug habit. He had no such drug habit before. So it had to be having sex with this prostitute that um, brought out this ego, right? That's correct. You know, essentially there you can see that the, the justification of wrongdoing, you know. The, there are, today there are unions of prostitutes all over the world. And they are call them, calling themselves sex workers. It's like a profession like any, any other profession. So, you know, the tragedy is that because of ignorance, our scientists know nothing about that, or if they know, they keep it quiet. Well, the time has come to speak more openly about that because ignorance is a sin. Knowledge is power. So now, what about another, another seven deadly sins? Arrogance, arrogance, you know, People call it pride, but it is the same thing. You know, instead of being humble, you know, being humble is a positive emotion and a positive attitude and a positive thought. It's part of consciousness, awareness, real intelligence. But arrogance creates only enemies, isn't it? You know, when you're a boss and you have a lot of employees working under your command and you treat them like slaves, you insult them every day, even you hit them physically, and you pay them peanuts, and you take part of their payment 
to yourself. Of course, they will hate you. And there is a moment, one of them maybe will come back one day with a machine gun and will kill not only you, they will kill all the other workers because this poor individual became crazy out of the reaction that you created. We call that going postal. Yes. Because years ago, there was an example of a postal employee who did just that, right? That's correct. And this is happening all over the world, every day, in different places. So arrogance doesn't pay, you know. It's also, actually, why are people arrogant? Because they have a complex of inferiority. And they want to show off that they are better, they are in a position of power, they want to impress the others, and they don't realize that being humble is a true intelligent emotion, is a true intelligent thought, is a true in intelligence attitude, conduct, based on consciousness, based on having a soul. Because in reality, people, you know, people who are racist, they have the same perception of reality. They look at other people like inferiors, you know, and that happened also with the monarchies. Oh, they are aristocratic individuals, they are also superior, you know, and also the division of classes, you know. You are a high class, you are a medium, middle class, or you are a, you know, just a labor, you know, a person who never learned to read and write. Another, another, you know, seven deadly sin. What about envy? Envy. What is envy, you know? It's, it's like somebody is making more money than you make and you feel you are better than the other person, you know, and at the end you suffer and you end hating that person. You do Sometimes unconsciously, you don't even realize what you're doing. You become, you create an enemy. And whatever you can do to destroy that person, you will do it without knowing it. So instead of learning to be content, content, you know, contentment, instead of envy. So you should learn from the other person. What makes the other person more successful than what you are? So learning, you know, from our enemies is, is a must. We have to learn. There, are, there is always somebody better than we are. So instead of competing with other people, we should learn to compete with ourselves. Then that way I can defeat my own negativity. I can defeat my own ego. I can defeat my own errors and mistakes and vices. So when I do that, I defeat myself. It's easier to defeat others. But in reality, because the hardest of the hardest is to compete with ourselves. So when we do it, you know, we ascend. And this is in real intelligence. This is a contentment, you know, will bring us, you know, into a different stage of consciousness, awareness, which is emotional intelligence and it's also intellectual intelligence. What about anger? You know, one of my students that came in the past to a Gnostic lecture was a psychiatrist. And he was arguing in the middle of the class that there was nothing wrong with anger. He was saying, oh, if you explode, you know, we have to explode, you know, from time to time because we will release, you know, that anger accumulated. And I was trying to argue with him and explaining that there are many people who have an explosion of anger and they have a heart attack. Not only they provoke a lot of harm, psychological harm or physical harm to the others, they also harm themselves. If you have a heart attack, what was the purpose of exploding, you know, with anger? Why don't you learn the opposite? To be serene, like a lake without waves, like an ocean without waves, peaceful. If you have peace in your heart, of course, you will transmit that peace outside of you. And you can stop a war. You can stop, you know, a, a conflict. You can even avoid people being killed, you know, if you do that. So serenity and patience are qualities, emotional expression of emotional intelligence, emotional, um, you know, intellectual intelligence, positive thoughts, positive thinking. So that's extremely important. So this is connected with the three brains, with the three activities, intellect, emotions, and motor activities. What about, you know, greed, okay? I remember there was a movie where the leading character or one of the leading characters was saying greed is good, you know, applauding himself because he was buying and selling in the stock market and he knew how to buy, you know, confidential information, you know, from behind the doors of the 
stock market. And that man became a billionaire. And at the end, he ends going to jail because he was discovered, you know. So greed wasn't so good at the end. But in reality, greed is never good. It's never good. It also creates enemies. People jump into wars out of greed. We lose our soul. We lose our consciousness. We create only enemies. And there is no small enemy. Remember my words. There is no small enemy. A tiny little enemy can destroy you in one second. Why do you need to create enemies? You see, and this is why there is no in real intelligence there. Greed is based on fear. Also, all seven deadly sins are coming from fear. You know, why are people greedy? After you have $100 million, you need to make a billion. After you make a billion, you would love to try to get many billions or maybe a trillion. You know, you never know. So at the end, it is fear of being poor. You cannot stop yourself. You're just going down into, you know, a, a crazy lifestyle. And so your bank account goes up, and, but you go down. Yeah. And after you die, after you die, you cannot take that money to the other side. So at the end, you know, maybe you forgot your own family, your own relatives, and they hate you so much. They are waiting for you to die to collect, you know, their, you know, their, their participation in your, in your capital, in your profits. But uh, greed is not when you have nothing and you're extremely in a state of poverty and you want to at least get to a standard of living that's reasonable for, for normal people. That is not greed. Well, essentially, you know, we have to understand the opposite of greed, which is what? Generosity. Okay, when, let's say you don't have any money to share your money with anybody else. Generosity means that you spend time with people who are worse than you are. If you do it, you know, this is the law of cause and effect. If you give and give and give without conditions, this is also an act of love. The one who gives, it's in the Bible, the one who gives will get back. If you give more, you will get more. But the one who gives nothing, even what he doesn't have, will be lost. What's the meaning of that? It means that if I give, 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 people will pay me back. Even if I don't, I'm not asking for it. People will return it. They will try to help, you know. I will create only friends around me. But if I don't give anything, even what I don't have will be taken away. What is that? Well, my body is not mine. My body will be taken away by Mother Nature when I die. My soul, is my soul mine? No, it's not. It belongs to Mother Nature. Mother Nature will take it away. I will lose my soul, my consciousness, because my ego ate. That monster called ego, the Satan of all religions, has eaten my soul. So I lose everything. I will end living in an inferno. I was a billionaire here. I die and I will become a beggar there. You know, and this is true. And I will come back with a different body. Maybe I will be a child dying of starvation in a week because, you know, I cannot, I mean, I don't deserve to live longer. And it's a way of teaching my soul that I shouldn't have done what I did in my past life. You see, it's a, a tragedy, it is. We create our own tragedies within the drama of life. So what you're saying, basically, from, any, from an intelligence point of view, IQ point of view, we use I IQ because it's intelligent quotient, but it's just a term that's been floating around for so long. Everybody me means that, uh, uses that term to mean, I should say, uh, just your level of smartness, right? Yes. And you're saying that uh, intelligence based in ego will bring you down, but when you start eliminating the ego and have that replaced with virtue, the intelligence now changes from just normal intelligence to wisdom. Would that be a correct statement? Th that's correct. That's correct. Totally correct. Yes. That, that creates the genius within, you know. We become in touch with our... We all have a genius within. Is the divinity, you know, within. So then we will get closer to the divinity because wisdom comes from the divinity. Wisdom and love and consciousness. Didn't you say in another lecture that emotional intelligence has to do with the pancreas? I think, I think you said that. Yeah, that's correct. 
Well, it, essentially, uh, let's talk about another seven deadly sin, and then we can we can go into the pancreas and, okay. and the heart. You know, which are part of emotional intelligence. Now, let's say another. We mentioned already three: lust, arrogance, anger, and envy. Okay, let's mention number five now. Uh, let's say uh, gluttony. Gluttony is not only eating and drinking heavily. It means that if we eat too much, of course, we are, our body is going to suffer, you know. We will develop all kinds of troubles, you know. Uh, diabetes and obe obesity, obesity, whatever. And our heart will be in trouble. We, we can collapse any, any time because we are overweight. But when we drink heavily, we will cook our liver. So it doesn't mean that we have to walk away from eating what we like or drinking from time to time. No, no, but moderation is the intelligence uh, answer to that situation. So basically drinking and eating with moderation, a balanced diet when we can have a, a, a delicious steak with Fruit, with salad, with salad instead of, you know, the kind of food that will make us, uh, you know, obese. So, and drinking, well, instead of drinking uh, an entire bottle of rum or whiskey, well, we drink a couple drinks, two or three drinks, that's it. You know, we don't need to drink the entire bottle or a, or a, a, a glass of wine, you know, two or two glasses of wine is, is okay or two beers maximum three beer, why do we need to drink an entire case of beer? And to fall on the ground and to begin vomiting like an idiot, you know, and the next morning we wake up completely sick, you know, hating ourselves and hating the world. Is that intelligence? Of course not. Moderation is really intelligent. This is number five. Number six, then laziness. What is laziness? You know, when Normally, we don't want to work. We don't want to produce because most of the time we hate our work. We hate what we do. Well, we, we were all born with talents and a vocation in life. You know, we have to discover what we really love. When we love something, normally we are better than average people doing that kind of activity. If you're an artist, concentrate into an artistic activity. If you cannot find a job, okay, work nine to five in something to stay alive and in the evenings or weekend concentrate in what you really love and eventually you will develop your own business in what you really were born to do you know your vocation in life and that will make you a happier individual so instead of being lazy because you hate your job or you don't want to work and you, you want to become a criminal you know for the easy lifestyle well, it's better, you know, that we understand that to become industrious, industrious means that you love what you do, you discover your vocation, and you, at the end, you will end working in what you were born to do. The trouble is our psychologists and psychiatrists don't consider the ego an enemy. They believe we need the ego to survive, and which is completely, completely wrong. Wrong, wrong, wrong. You know, they don't realize that the ego is animal psychology. If we want to move higher into becoming a real human being with true intelligence of a human, then this is what we need to do. You know, animals have an instinctive intelligence, but we are higher than animals. We become, we became intellectual animals. So we have an intellectual intelligence and we have a capability to become more intelligent than animals and also emotional intelligence. When you did mention, so basically the seven deadly sins are the opposite of intelligent. We could say chronic stupidity. Now, let's go the other way to develop real emotional intelligence and intellectual intelligence. The seven deadly sins are an incredible way of rediscovering, you know, our path. What should we do to move within the ladder, the Jacob's ladder, and and to transform ourselves, you know, and to discover true intelligence. Well, most people don't even know that there is a possibility of being transformed. 
That's correct. You know? Yes. And I, yeah. I guess, what about the hopelessness of these people who are committing riots and, and so forth? They have this sense that there's no way out. But what you're going to describe next is a way out, isn't it? Yeah. Essentially, you know, one of them is uh, education. We have to change the program of education worldwide. From kindergarten up to universities, up to PhDs, we have to learn, you know, we have to share the entire discoveries of the human race from the past, from the modern times, and to share that with the entire human race. This is why, you know, I don't want to scare anybody and I don't want to offend anybody, but this is why the global catastrophe that we're facing already is happening because of us. You know, Mother Nature is vomiting us, is rejecting our presence on Earth. We don't deserve to be around and we don't realize it. We don't realize it. We believe we are okay the way we are. We say there is no, life has no meaning. Well, there is a meaning. So essentially, by just, you know, Samaela Unveor wrote 70 books. We would recommend that you approach those 70 books through Gnostic Anthropology, you know, GnosticTeachings.org, O-R-G, and also through our own lectures that are schools of Gnostic Anthropology all over the world. And also our mission is to share the, this knowledge, this information with everyone, and also in the future, we expect to be able to create schools and universities that will be able to re-educate all of us. You said in another lecture the pancreas was part of emotional intelligence, and this is what this lecture basically is all about, emotional intelligence, right? Yeah. It, essentially, you know, the, the emotional brain is in our solar plexus. You know, we explained that already, and then... Uh, our pancreas is, we could call it the inferior emotional antenna, and the heart is the superior emotional antenna. So we can speak about superior emotional intelligence and inferior emotional intelligence. So the pancreas is connected with telepathy. Many people who are into ESP, they are convinced that telepathy is connected with the brain. Well, there is a connection with the brain because the seven endocrine glands are within the entire organism, you know. In the brain, we have two endocrine glands. The pineal gland, which is connected with superior intellectualism, which is inspiration and creative willpower. So the crown of the brain, where we receive information from the universe. You know, the sunlight descending from the stars and our own sun enters through our pineal gland and going in, in circles all the way down until it touches our two feet. And that way we transmit the energy to the interior of the planet Earth. So inspiration is coming from there. So if we do certain practices that Gnostic anthropology is teaching us, we can open up those centers. They are the same seven chakras of yoga or connected with the seven chakras. And then we can open up those centers in the superior intellect pineal gland, and also the pituitary gland, the third eye, which is creative imagination, or the third eye, or clairvoyance. But the heart is emotional intelligence. The heart is emotional intelligence. And the pancreas is also emotional intelligence. So when we connect telepathically with someone, what happens? We feel from the pancreas the presence of someone telling us something, and immediately we visualize with the third eye because we send a signal from the pancreas into the pituitary gland and we see that person. Maybe in the past, maybe right now, and suddenly we get a phone call. The person is calling and we say, oh, I was just thinking in you. No, I was just feeling you. And then telepathically we connected because I transform that emotional intelligence into intellectual intelligence, translating into my own language, because we all speak different languages. So I transmit into thoughts, translate into thoughts and words. And suddenly I meet the person on the street, you know, and I feel the presence of that person, that telepathy. Can we develop that telepathic capability? Of course we could. We could. Gnostic anthropology teaches us how to do it. 
Now, what about our heart? The heart is superior emotional intelligence. Right. It's basically intuition. Intuition is direct knowledge without thinking. It's like the divinity is telling us what to do. The universe is telling us what to do. And we never listen. We prefer to listen to the brain through thinking. Oh, we are thinking for years and years and years. We get white hair. We exhaust the intellectual brain. And at the end, we cannot think anymore. And we never get an answer. And the conclusion will be, oh, life has no meaning. I'm depressed. I'm tired. I'm old. That's it. This is it. But in reality, if we learn to use our emotional intelligence, we can balance our true intelligence and we can really perceive reality without thinking. Now, through Gnostic anthropology and Gnostic cosmology, we spoke in other lectures about the Aquarian age. It means the planet Earth and the entire solar system and are entering within the constellation of Aquarius. And when we did that, since 1962, we entered in the constellation of Aquarius. Now, there is a big change of human conduct, human behavior. Instead of developing our intellect, the time has come to develop our emotional intelligence. This is why everybody is trying to talk and argue about emotional intelligence, which is basically the foundation of emotional intelligence is intuition. Intuition is the voice of the divinity telling us what to do. So this is the age of intuition because there is no much time if we face, if we are going to face a global catastrophe that is happening already step by step. We have to prepare for the future. We have to learn to become really intelligent and the highest level of intelligence is intuition. Listening from the creator of the universe that lives also within our own heart. This is a superior emotional intelligence. Intuition. Well, Walter Russell said the same thing. Basically, uh, we're all connected together. He wrote a book called The Universal One, which means through a very complicated system of octaves and notes and tone tonalities, we're all connected. And universal intelligence happens throughout the universe. And uh, geniuses can tap into that. And that's what makes them intelligent, right? That's correct. And Samuel yeah. Allen Weir says the same thing, but he says it in, in a different way. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's correct. Yeah, this is actually universal knowledge, you know, that we should be able to absorb, you know, because there is no much time. Well, we've given the listener a bit of information here. Thank you very much for downloading this podcast. My name is Richard Rucroft. My guest, my host, co-host, is Mr. E. Jim G. Ross. Thank you to our listeners and thank you to Jim. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Thank you to our listeners. It's been an honor to be here.